Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron. If you don't know me, I'm an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. And this month's elder law presentation is about living with memory loss. Now, I know that's a topic that you may not want to talk about because you don't want to think about it, but this is a really, really important topic. It's part of, it's part of Frank and Mary's life. You know, you get older and there's this possibility. So we're going to talk about my friends Frank and Mary. You've heard about them before and their, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And they have, you know, they have a house and they've got savings and they've got, and Frank's got an IRA, so they've got some assets. Um, and we're assuming that they're simply living on their social security check. Um, and Frank's is $2,000 a month, Mary's is half of that or $1,000 a month. So they're all fine and they've been living in their house forever and that's where they want to stay. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard, uh, and that, which is a, a common goal of a lot of my clients. So the question though that they're facing today is what happens if Mary's memory is having, if she's having some problems, if she's finding this is early on and she's having some, you know, she, she's just feeling, or Frank is noticing it, she's just not remembering things as well. So the most common reaction of Frank and Mary in this case is to stick your head in the ground and just pretend that it's not happening. Um, because who wants to be thinking about this, right? And so, it's the most common thing is you just either you just ignore it or you say, oh, well, this is just getting old, you know, and it's the usual things, you know. And that's okay for a while, except that if, if that's the way you're reacting to this, then it may have negative repercussions later on because you won't be as prepared later on and because you will not have spent the time um, when Mary is, is having early stages of memory loss, but the problem isn't really severe. You're not t taking the time to adapt your lives to that and actually in many ways therefore slow down the memory loss. So what you really want to do in this case is check it out. Don't bury your head in the sand. If, 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 you, if Mary has got memory loss, it isn't like an urgent thing. It isn't like she's got memory loss and that means she's going to be in a nursing home tomorrow, you know, or that she's going to die of this tomorrow. But it's something that you want to bring up with your doctor. So the next time Mary goes to the doctor, she needs to say, you know, I'm having, I think I'm having some problems here and let the doctor figure out whether that's a serious problem. Now, most uh, primary care physicians, um, will at that point either tell you or give you a short test uh, to kind of test your memory. And then if they've got concerns that you, you might be experiencing memory loss that is unusual, then they may send you to a person who specializes in that, who would be a neurologist, a person who specializes in issues that involve the brain or issues that involve the nervous system and stuff. So you, 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 that may be where things go, right? And then if you go to a neurologist and the doctor refers you to a neurologist, and once again, Medicare is gonna be paying for this, um, then, then the neurologist can give you a kind of a more thorough sense of whether the memory loss is something that you should be worried about, um, whether it, it, and, and how you may be able to adapt to it. That doctor may also be able to tell you if there are any medicines at that time that could help you out. I think probably many seniors are aware of the fact that there was recently an FDA approval of a medicine that was supposed to be dealing with very early stage memory loss. Now there were whole questions about how effective that was and what the side effects are and there were all those issues that you'd want to talk to with a neurologist. Um, but the point is you don't want to assume that you know everything that's in existence that might be able to help you out. You want to talk to the professionals about it. And finally, you really want to talk, you may want to talk to the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is really a fabulous organization. And by the way, that's why I think all seniors should be donating to the Alzheimer's Association. This is a really, you're kind of helping yourself by making sure this organization is there to help you if you need it. But among other things, the Alzheimer's Association has a 24 hour hotline. So if you want to just give them a call and say, look, this is what I'm experiencing. 
Um, the National Association will refer you to someone locally, someone in the Massachusetts Association, who could in turn refer you to doctors who specialize in this, to neurologists, to a whole, to programs that might exist in your community. So it's just a great idea to get acquainted with those folks um, um, and to have them help you feel whether or not you've got an issue or in, and whether it's just, you know, you were just overly worried and it's not a problem. So anyway, you need to do that. Um, then, if it turns out that Mary does have some memory loss and there are some problems, you got to take a breath, right? You can't like lapse into this tremendous depression because of the fact that you have a medical condition, right? A lot of people have a lot of different medical conditions. So think about it. It's not cancer. It's not cancer. You're not like imminently going to die or have to go through chemo or all this other stuff. It's not back pain. I often talk to my clients. I say, you know, if I had a choice between a bad back and a bad memory, I'll take a bad memory, right? It, it, Alzheimer's isn't, you know, or, or memory loss is memory loss. It isn't like it's causing nausea. It isn't causing pain. So just accept the fact that, you ha you, that you've got, you have some, some symptoms, some very early symptoms of a sickness that may progress and so you want to be prepared for that. You want to figure out a plan. You want to figure out a plan together. Frank and Mary need to figure this out together. If, and and, and, you, and if, if, Frank, if you're Frank and you're seeing that Mary is having some problems, and you, don't, you have to bring it up, right? You know, it isn't a matter of you know, trashing Mary, of oh, how come you never remember this stuff anymore? It's a matter of just saying, oh, Mary may be sick and this may be a very, very early uh, symptom, and so we're gonna deal with this. So how do you deal with it? Well, first of all, you talk to the people who are used to dealing with it, right? Go to your senior center. It, you will be amazed how much the folks at the senior center know about this and know about the folks to whom they can refer you to you. Why? Because they're dealing with it all the time. You know, because, because memory loss issues are typically senior issues. So they're gonna know where to go. Talk to the folks at your Aging Services Access Point or ASAP. And now, you know, for folks who have been to my presentations before, they're familiar with that term. For the rest of se the senior world, it's like the what, right? So Massachusetts is divided into a set of regions. I think there are 26 regions now. Each region uh, has a nonprofit organization in it called an Aging Services Access Point. That organization is the great funnel through which the federal government and, Mass and the Commonwealth, in this case, funnel resources and programs for seniors. Now, I work in two ASAP regions, uh, um, here, right here in Marlboro, where I live, and in Westboro, um, where I have my office. We're in the Bay Path Elder Services region. That office is right here in Marlboro. They have a lot of staff. I want to say they have over 200 staff that deal with a whole variety of issues. This is not a for-profit entity. You're not going to walk in the door and they're going to charge you. Their job and their charter, really, from the federal and the state governments is to help you deal with all issues having to do with aging. And of course, this is a big one, right? If, if I'm on Martha's Vineyard uh, or Nantucket, then those folks are dealing with elder services of Cape Cod and the islands. The offices for that organization are in Dennis, but they have representatives on both islands. Uh, you can reach out to somebody in, on either island and get this figured out. Talk to somebody. Once again, they're going to know who the people are that you could talk to. And finally, and this is a strong recommendation of mine all the time, find a geriatric care manager. What is a geriatric care manager? Um, Uh-oh. Uh Sorry, what is a geriatric care manager? It's a person, typically a nurse or a social worker was their background, who decided that what they really wanted to do for the rest of their lives was to work with you, to work with seniors, and to develop care plans and to help manage those care plans. So their whole job is, is, is really kind of twofold. One, to know what all the programs are and who all the people are who, are, who can be of help to you as, you, as right now, or as your um, dementia symptoms progress, as your memory loss symptoms progress, right? And also to be your advocates be, with, with your doctor, with the hospital, with anybody else, 
in terms of helping you qualify for these kinds of programs. So it's really important as early as you can, get to know one of those folks. There are a handful of them that I, you know, that I deal with regularly. I, I, have to, I have to confess my favorite is a woman named Sandy Cordovi, who's on Martha's Vineyard, who I've always told people is the greatest geriatric care manager I've ever met. But there are a, lot, but there are a number of these folks they're typically, they're, 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 they're doing this job because they really like it, right? So you wanna to talk to them. Then you need to figure out a plan. Uh, if you're Mary and you're suffering from early um, memory loss symptoms, this isn't, there isn't an urgency about this plan, but if your goal is to stay home um, and not end up in a nursing home, then the, you have a couple of questions. First, if home is gonna be home, that is you're just gonna stay in your house, because you want to stay in your house until you die and be buried in the backyard, then what are the things that you need to do to make sure you can do that? Well, there may be some, some things that you can do to just improve the safety of your home uh, with, in, so that you're not this much less likely that you're going to fall. So that, and for any number of things, make sure the bathroom is more safe. There are a lot of things that you may want to install. And you may want to prepare for the fact that if your memory loss um, problems get greater, you may need somebody to be helping you out. Now I know, just like putting your head in the sand regarding you know, whether you have memory loss, people will put their head in the sand and say, oh, you know, my family will take care of this. Uh, you know, I've, got, I've got great daughters and sons, and typically daughters, the sons are typically pretty useless, but sometimes you get a great son who will be really helpful. Um, but don't count on the fact that they're going to be able to take care of all, that they're going to be able to really help you out all the time. Because remember, everybody that you're thinking about has a day job. Your kids probably have kids. They probably also have jobs, right? They may need the money. They can't afford to be just helping you out, right? They may be able to come over on occasion, but they can't be coming over all the time. So you need to figure out, kind of in the long run, if you needed more care at home, where's the money gonna come from, right? Now, in Frank and Mary's case, no, no, not unlike a lot of us, they have some savings, and they've been saving, among other things, to make sure that, that they could take care of their lives until they died, figuring that at the end they wanted, they wanted to leave money to their kids. And I know Frank and Mary at this point are thinking that the amount they're gonna to leave to their kids is you know, $900,000, because that's the value of their house and of the IRA and of the savings. And they're you know, all depressed because, oh my God, I really wanna leave them all this money. So at that point, you kinda of have to get over it and say, look, we saved this money to take care of each other. If there's extra money that's gonna to go to the kids, that's great. But we saved this money to take care of each other. Right? I always tell my kids, I said, I love you all, but I married your mother. I fell in love with your mother. Right? You wanna take care of each other. So in this case, you know, you, Frank knows that they've got some resources. He's, Frank's got the, the, the tax deferred money, they've got some savings. So you know, they may be, Frank may be wanting to think about whether he wants to be withdrawing some of those tax deferreds in the short run, at which point the tax rate on those tax deferred funds that he's withdrawing isn't gonna be that high versus leaving all of the money in the account until suddenly he needs to withdraw it all because they're trying to restructure assets for nursing home purposes and all of a sudden he's got a big tax hit. So you may want to think about that. Regarding his home, he wants to stay in his home until he dies. So if that's the case, he, he, you, he may want to make sure he can use his home in the event that Mary needs home care or the event that one of them needs home care to be able to stay at home. That's as important as doing any of those physical repairs. The way that he may wanna do that or that they may wanna do that early on is by, us by using the equity in their home to get a loan, to get a line of credit loan. Now there are two obvious alternatives in that case, a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, which you can typically get from your local bank, or a reverse mortgage. You want to investigate both of those and weigh them out. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of them. The advantage of the HELOC is that you just go down to the banker with you, you know, and you're, you're probably going to be able to get that, or you may be able to get that HELOC. A HELOC is simply a line of credit. It's like a really big credit card that you get from the bank, um, but it's secured by a mortgage on your property. So you, want to, you may want to talk to the bank, find out based on the current value of your property, 
how big a HELOC they'll give you. Typically, the, 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 the setup cost for that or the closing cost regarding doing that mortgage is not going to be that great. It's not as expensive as it is for a first mortgage. And typically, um, it's going to be a line of credit and there's not going to be any interest that's going to be owed until you've withdrawn some money. And typically, but once again, this is going to vary by bank, you don't have to pull out any of the money right now. So you could have this line of credit, so you simply have this really big credit card that's backed up by a mortgage on your house, and so the interest rate's really low, and you're not running up any interest rate, interest yet. Now the bad news of the HELOCs, it, well there are a couple. One, once you've borrowed money, you owe them a monthly payment. And so if you're thinking you're Frank and Mary and you've got kind of a fixed income and you're thinking in the future, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford all this stuff, well, uh, um, then, then you, you really may be kind of wanting to say, well, maybe I don't want a line of credit where I'm going to be having to make these big monthly payments in addition to everything else, right? Second thing is HELOCs usually are for a fixed time, typically the standard HELOC will have this line of credit feature where you're only paying interest on the amount that you borrow for a period of, I want to say 10 years. And then after that, the, it, the mortgage, the, the payments turn into like a regular payment that you'd have like on a first mortgage. So now you're paying interest in principal. Well, if you're structuring this because you're concerned, not that you need money now, but that in the future you need, may need money, the future may be just the time where you don't want to be increasing your payment. Right? So, so you want to be kind of weighing that out. On the other hand, a reverse mortgage doesn't have those features. A reverse mortgage is a line of credit loan secured by a mortgage uh, on which you don't have to borrow any upfront. Uh, so it's a exactly like the HELOC except that when you do borrow money, uh, there's no monthly payment that's due. The reverse mortgages, as everybody knows, aren't due until you sell the house or you die. Um, and, and, and so it may be that that's the kind of feature that you want. On the other hand, a HELOC is going to cost you much more in upfront costs. Uh, and the reason for that is that, th that these programs are, are, are supported by the federal government, the Federal Housing Administration, and basically the way that they pay for that program is that they, they, they get, will guarantee the lender that if for some reason when the loan comes due, the equity in the house is so low that it can't be paid, the federal government pays it and they do it through a mortgage insurance program and you have to put money into the mortgage insurance program. So that's how one of the main reasons why the reverse mortgage is expensive up front. But you may want to consider that. You may want to look at other programs. Um, the, you know, there are, there, are, there are a bunch, right? One, go to, once again, go talk to the ASAP. There is a wonderful program called ECOP uh, or Enhanced Community Options through which, which, for which you are probably eligible if you're Frank and Mary. Uh, this is not an asset-based program, so you're eligible no matter what your assets. Uh, and then, and, it, and if you get the, if you get the, uh, the program, then it, this is state-funded, uh, and they will provide a given number of hours, typically six to ten, about six to 10 hours a, day, a, a week, no more than that. You'll pay a small copay for that, for that, but the prices are really very good. Uh, in addition to that, um, you may want to look at day programs that you may want to participate in. Uh, in Marlboro, and there's, a, there's a, a coordinated day program in three of the communities where I work, in Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro, where <coughs> if you're having memory issues and you want to, uh, to um, come to the program during the day, you can stay for the day. The other program participants are all folks who've got memory issues like you. Uh, your caregiver, in this case Frank, could you know, have you stay for that program. It's, it's not like a full day program. It's like two or three hours. There's typically a meal involved. And in the meantime, Frank can then get stuff done that he might need to get done. Uh, there's a simil very similar program called Daybreak, or excuse me, called uh, a, a similar program run by the Martha's Vineyard Center for Living, uh, which has been extremely successful. They've got programs that run literally every day. If you're in a community where you don't have these programs and you've got early memory loss, well, maybe this is a time for you to talk to some of your friends or talk to the senior center and figure out how to create that program because you may want that program once you really need it. Finally, there are typically caregiver support groups and caregiver support training programs 
in all of these communities that are sponsored by the ASAPs, that are sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association, you want to learn about those. So if you're married and, and the, the, your, your uh, symptoms are getting worse, so you're in what I'll call mid-stage mid or mid to late stage of memory loss pro problems, then you may be wanting to look at a different set of programs. Um, these are programs that are funded, or this program is funded by MassHealth. It's the major program through which the government will help provide the support that you might want at home to provide for some of these caregivers. It's called the Frail Elder Waiver. In order to qualify, excuse me. I noticed that my Frank and Mary cup, which has the masks, is getting out, is now outdated. Hopefully, for, hopefully it'll be outdated for a long time. So um, to qualify for the program, you first need to show really that you re really are having some real serious memory problems. Uh, to qualify, you need to show medically that if, you, if it weren't for the care being given to you at home, that you might actually be eligible for nursing home care. The standard for that is that you would, that you would need either const regular assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, or transferring, or, and this is the, really the relevant one to, to Mary who has memory loss, that you really need to have somebody with you all the time um, around for your own safety. Uh, not necessarily to help you do things, but because you may wander. You may turn on the stove and forget to shut it off. There are a whole number of things. So uh, if you're, and, and by the way, the people who certify whether or not you're medically eligible are the folks from the ASAP. So that's yet another reason to know those folks early on so that if you're having some other problems, they can be there, they'll know what the current qualification standards are, and they can help you qualify. Second, if you meet the medical standard, there's also a financial standard. Uh, in Frank and Mary's case, if Mary needs the program and Frank is still with her at home, they can qualify, or Mary can qualify as soon as she can show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Well, of course, they have a boatload more than $2,000. But the key to this program is that Frank, as the healthy spouse, can own the home no matter what the equity. Once again, I want you to hear that because folks are, folks, some folks here are listening who are from Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket and they're saying, well, you know, the, my, all our value is in our house. No matter what the value of the home, if, you, if the home is owned by the, the, the healthy spouse, it doesn't count. Um, Frank can have as much as, right now, $130,360 in other cash or cash equivalent assets, and he can have unlimited income. Now, in this particular case, as we discussed, they have more than, Frank has more than that in assets. So the, the plan here would be all assets get shifted to Frank from Mary, and by the way, that can be done at the last minute. This planning does not have to happen ahead of time. Uh, it can be done at the last minute because there's no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So we transfer everything to, to, um, to Frank. Frank keeps the house. I would advise Frank then of his other money to keep, say, $100,000, use the remaining money to buy an annuity. If he's buying that annuity uh, and it has these characteristics to it, then the, the purchase is a legitimate spend down of his assets so that he's getting his assets below that magic $130,000 figure. Um, and he's simply turning that money into an income stream. And Frank, remember, is allowed to have unlimited income. So the, the annuity has to call for equal monthly payments over a term shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. If Frank is 80 in, in, in this example, his life expectancy at that point is about uh, nine or 10 years. Uh, and, the, and the annuity purchase has to be irrevocable and undamendable. So he has, he has to not have the ability to cash it in. But once he's done that, the next day, Mary qualifies for the program. Now, once she's qualified, if her income, her income, not counting Frank's, from pension and social security is less than $2,402 per month, and by the way, this changes every year, then MassHealth will agree to, to whatever number of hours MassHealth ag agrees to, they'll pay for the whole bill. If Mary's income is higher than that, then Mary's gonna have, it all to, to be, have to pay a deductible before the MassHealth money kicks in. And because the deductible is very high, the deductible is equal to her income minus about $500. Remember in this case, her income was only $1,000 a month, but if her income were $3,000, her deductible would be $2,500. 
So this program only works if you really need a lot of care, if Mary's income is high. So the point of this is, to summarize, if you've got early memory problems, deal with it. Just deal with it. Talk to the doctor, talk to a neurologist, figure out if the problems are real. And if they are, figure out a plan. It's not cancer, it's not back pain, and it's not happening right away. You've got a lot of time, figure out a plan, get the right professionals involved so that when, when you really do need them, they're gonna be there for you. So if you wanna see this presentation again, uh, they're always available on, my, on the Elder Law Frank and Mary website, or you can always call me at 508-860-1470 if you have any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you next month.